The Second Battle of Ypres, Part 3, The British Take Up the Line. For most of 1915, the Germans concentrated their efforts against the Russians on the Eastern Front. However, they did mount one major offensive around Ypres between late April and early June. Today, the battle is remembered mainly for the Germans' first use of poison gas, the first time it had been employed as a weapon in the theater of war. But it also saw old British army regiments, like the 1st Hampshire, subjected to what the regimental historian C.T. Atkinson had described as perhaps the severest strain in the whole war. The battle opened on April 22, 1915, with a German chlorine gas attack on the northern sector of the Ypres salient. The French troops holding the sector were completely surprised and they swiftly gave way, thus exposed, exposing the left flank of the Canadian 1st Division. BEF reinforcements were rushed to the front, but on April 24, the Germans extended their attack to the Canadian front, driving forward to capture the village at St. Julian. Meanwhile, the 11th Brigade had been ordered north from Klogstuart to Ypres, with 1st Hampshire arriving at Poperingue to be greeted by the sight of French and Algerian victims of the gas attack and the smell of chlorine lingering in the air. On April 25th, the 11th Brigade, by now placed under the 28th Division, was ordered to relieve the scattered detachments between St. Julian and Berlin Wood. With confusion reigning in the sector, this was to prove easier said than done, and it was not until 2 a.m. on April 26th, after a night march across unfamiliar ground, that the battalion finally began to dig in. When the early morning mist lifted, a ferocious German bombardment started. Salvo after salvo of heavy shells hit the makeshift Hampshire line in rapid succession. The 1st Battalion, War Diary, describes vividly the hurricane of steel unleashed on the Hampshires. With the lifting of the mist, the German guns opened. It is hopeless to attempt to describe it. Owing to our being at the extreme point of the salient, we had guns almost all around us, and owing to the shape of the ground and the Germans holding ridges to the north and east, which commanded every yard of the Epe of Enclave, these guns could be laid with deadly accuracy. For eight days and nights their guns never ceased. At times, shells were falling on our trenches at a rate of about 50 a minute. We had three batteries of howitzers playing on us at once from different directs, sending in bouquets of 12 HE high explosive shells at once. The marvel was that anyone was left alive or any trench existing. All there is to be said is that we hung on from daylight on the 26th April till darkness on May 3rd, and not only did we not give way one yard, but we pushed our trenches forward on the right towards the Royal Fusiliers, and extended them on the left till we eventually joined on to the Rifle Brigade, and at the end our line was intact, and not a man was left behind except our hundred dead. At one point, the Hampshire Battalion's headquarters staff were buried. 
when a shell landed nearby. Fortunately, the commanding officer, Colonel Frederick Hicks, though buried up to his neck, managed to summon men to dig him out, along with the adjutant and the orderlies. The heavy shelling continued throughout the day, but the Hampshires thwarted all German attempts to break through. Casualties, however, were heavy. 59 men killed and missing, probably buried, with a further 100 wounded. That night, the first Hampshires worked hard to repair their battered trenches in preparation for a renewed German assault. This duly arrived at daylight on April 27th. But while the bombardment continued all day and was repeated for the next hour, next four, it never reached the same intensity of the 26th. Afternoon, April 25th, 1915. The York and Durham Brigade units of the Northumberland Division, which comprised of the 1st Battalion, 4th Green Howards, and the 1st Battalion, 4th East Yorkshire Regiment, counterattacked, failing to secure their objectives, but establishing a new line closer to the village. This was around the village of Welchie, where they withdrew to in the dark. The 6th Durham Light Infantry was sent to the GHQ line, and the 8th Battalion began a long hike in the rain through Zonibik to relieve the 8th Canadian Battalion at Boatlier's Farm on the Grabenstaffel Ridge, arriving in the early hours of April 25th. The Northumberland and York and Durham Brigades were to be the Corps Reserve for an attack on St. Julian on April 25th. Two battalions of the York and Durham Brigade, the 1st Battalion, 5th Green Howards, and the 1st Battalion, 5th Durham Light Infantry, and the four of the Northumbrian Brigade supported the attacks of the 10th Brigade. But, due to poor communications and timing errors, gained little but casualties from artillery. The 8th DLI, with a company of Monmouths and one of the Middlesex Regiment, suffered almost constant shelling throughout the day, some of it from the rear from the southern end of the Savigny, but held on to repulse a German attack in the evening. Early the next morning, the exposed position north of the Grabenstaffel Kierslayer Road was flanked, and the battalion suffered from machine gun fire in Ampelay and was forced to fall back by sections. Even then, stopping the German advance with rifle fire, reaching a more established line, and the reinforcements that had been promised earlier came late in the day. The battalion was reduced to 146 officers and men. The 6th and 7th DLI were used to support the 85th Brigade around Zivinkot and Zonibik and were shelled throughout the day. The Northumberland Brigade was to suffer once more from poor communications on April 26th. Concentrated around Welchi, the brigade was designated the reserve for the 1st Canadian Division. In the morning, the 5th Northumberland Fusiliers was ordered to reconnoiter and block a possible German attack from Fort Chewin. Reaching the village, it came under artillery fire and dug in. At 1.30 p.m., orders were received for the rest of the brigade to attack St. Julian in cooperation with the Lahore Division and 10th Brigade. This was the first attack by a territorial brigade in the war, with 
only 35 minutes in which to prepare before the start of the attack, no artillery support was obtained, and the routes through the wire of the GHQ line were unknown. As a result, the troops were slow in leaving and presented targets for the Germans. On reaching the front line, the 10th Brigade could not be found, as its orders had changed. On April 26th, the 4th, 6th, and 7th battalions, the Northumberland Brigade, attacked. Advancing from here, the 6th Northumberland Fusiliers took some trenches the Germans had retired from, so that they now had a foothold in the village. The 4th and 7th battalions were unable to leave the front line. Under artillery fire, the 6th battalion dug in, but were forced to withdraw during the night. The Northumberland Brigade lost 1,954 officers and men, over two-thirds of its strength, during the day. The next few days were spent preparing the new line, to which the Allies were to fall back to, and alternately holding the front line often reinforcing other units in company strength, all while under fire. The infantry of this novice and unacclimatized division was withdrawn from the salient during the night of May 2nd to May 3rd, having lost 3,764 men killed, wounded, and missing since April 24th. On May 5th, the 5th Cumberland Battalion of the Border Regiment joined the Northumbrian Brigade to reinforce it. The 2nd Royal Dublin Fusiliers arrived in France in the month that war was declared as part of the 10th Brigade in the 4th Division. The division was part of the British Expeditionary Force, the BEF. These were the professional soldiers of the old regular army, known as the Old Contemptibles, after a comment made by the German Kaiser. The Second Dublins took part in the retreat following the Battle of Mons, taking part in their first engagement on August 26, 1914, at Le Cateau, that helped delay the German advance towards Paris inflicting such heavy casualties that the Germans thought that they faced more machine guns than they actually did. The BEF then resumed their retreat, but many men, including the Dublin Fusiliers, were stranded behind German lines, and many were taken prisoner by the Germans. The battalion, badly depleted, later took part in the Battle of the Marne on September 5th to 9th that finally halted the German advance, just on the outskirts of Paris, forcing the Germans to retreat to the Aisne. There, the Second Dublins took part in the Battle of the Aisne, and later took part in their last major engagement of the year at the Battle of Messines, which began on October 12th and ended on November 2nd. The Second Dublins took part in all but Kitchener Wood and Mauser Ridge during the Second Battle of Ypres. The battalion suffered heavily at the Battle of St. Julian on April 24th, losing hundreds of casualties and was nearly annihilated. Despite their heavy casualties, the 2nd Battalion Royal Dublin Fusiliers participated without respite in the battles at Fresenburg and Belawar. On May 24th, the battalion was subject to a German poison gas attack near St. Julian and effectively disintegrated as a fighting unit. The British at that time had no reliable defenses against gas attacks 
the Second Dublins, Commanding Officer Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Loveband of Nas died the following day. The battalion did not take part in any more major battles for the rest of the year. After the first German chlorine gas attacks, Allied troops were supplied with masks of cotton pads soaked in urine. It had been widely reported by them that urea in the pad neutralized the chlorine. The pads were held over the face until the gas dispersed. Other soldiers preferred to use a handkerchief, sock, or flannel body belt dampened with a sodium bicarbonate solution and tied across the mouth and nose until the gas passed. Soldiers found it difficult to fight like this and attempts were made to develop a better means of protection against gas attacks. By July 1915, soldiers received efficient gas masks and anti-asphyxiation respirators. Back to the Hampshire's story. On April 29th, it was decided to withdraw to more favorable defensive positions. But preparations for this took some time, and First Hampshire had to hang on in their exposed trenches for a further three days. German shelling increased in intensity once more, and May 1st and May 2nd added another 50 to the battalion's casualty list. However, the Hampshire were fortunate in that they escaped the gas attacks launched against their neighboring brigades. The crucial day for the 11th Brigade was May 3rd, when a bombardment of greater intensity than ever began around daybreak and continued nearly all day. At about 3 p.m., enemy infantry began to advance against the buffs in Berlin Wood on the Hampshire right, giving the 1st Battalion's rifles and machine guns excellent targets as they tried to enter the wood. Later in the afternoon, the Germans, having finally driven the buffs out of Buff Wood, turned their attention to the Hampshire, but were decisively repulsed with heavy losses. Only at 9 p.m. that day did the Hampshire finally begin the retirement to the new positions identified on April 29th. The fighting on May 3rd cost the 1st Battalion a further 40 casualties, bringing the total since April 26th to 6 officers and 116 other ranks killed and missing, among them some irreplaceable NCOs. Another five officers and 208 other ranks had been wounded. The Hampshires were highly praised by the army authorities, from the commander-in-chief downwards for their action at Berlin Wood. The battalion could claim that, despite scanty artillery support, it had never lost a trench. The unceasing shelling and German attacks had tested discipline, endurance, and training to the utmost, all of which bore testament to the calm and steadiness of the CEO, Colonel Hicks, ably supported by Major Lawrence Polk. The Hampshires saw further action at Second Eve after another major German assault around Fresenberg on May 8th. Two days later, the battalion moved up to the front between Canadian Farm and Hampshire Farm, where it was to endure another very hard week, including a big German attack on May 13th. Once more, the assault opened with a massive bombardment. One officer wrote that at one time, the whole line of trench disappeared in a yellow cloud of smoke, and the earth was absolutely rocking. 
When the bombardment lifted, German infantry moved toward forward, but in the face of withering Hampshire fire, only a few made it to the wire, where they too were shot down. One soldier who particularly distinguished himself in the fighting was drummer Eldridge, who gallantly manned a barricade in a communication trench, which German infantry were threatening to overrun. Eldridge refused to retire until he had thrown all the bombs at hand, around 60, and kept the enemy at bay for half an hour despite being wounded. He received the Distinguished Conduct Medal and the French Croix de Guerre for his bravery. Two further attacks were repulsed during the day, which cost the Hampshire 90 casualties. But once again, the line was maintained intact. The Hampshire went back into the divisional support line on May 14th, but returned to the front, this time just west of Mousetrap Farm between the 19th and 22nd of May. By this time, the fighting had died down and casualties numbered half a dozen. The 1st Battalion's final stint in the line during 2nd Ypres, just east of Pochi, began on May 27th and lasted a week. Casualties amounted to fewer than 20, with only three men being killed. 2nd Ypres was a hard and exhausting struggle with the old army divisions, the 4th, 5th, 27th, and 28th, bearing the brunt of the fighting for the British. Between them, they suffered 41,000 of the 59,000 British casualties, and the battle was to be the last major action on the Western Front, fought predominantly by the British Old Army units. Private W. Hay of the Royal Scots arrived in Ypres just after the chlorine gas attack on April 22nd. We knew there was something wrong. We started to march towards Ypres, but we could not get past on the road with refugees coming down the road. We went along the railway line to Ypres and there were people civilians and soldiers lying along the roadside in a terrible state. We heard them say it was gas. We didn't know what the hell gas was. When we got to Ypres, we found a lot of Canadians lying there dead from gas the day before. Poor devils and it's quite a horrible sight for us young men. I was only 20, so it was quite traumatic, and I've never forgotten, nor ever will forget it. The Daily Chronicle, April 26, 1915. The French soldiers were naturally taken by surprise. Some got away in time, but many, alas, not understanding the new danger were not so fortunate and were overcome by the fumes and died poisoned. Among those who escaped nearly all cough and spit blood, the chlorine attacking the mucous membrane. The dead were turned black at once. About 15 minutes after letting the gas escape, the Germans got out of the trenches. Some of them were sent on in advance with masks over their heads to ascertain that the air had become breathable. Having discovered that they could advance, they arrived in large numbers in the area on which the gas had spread itself some minutes before and took possession of the arms of the dead men. They made no prisoners.
Whenever they saw a soldier whom the fumes had not quite killed, they snatched away his rifle and advised him to lie down to die better. The Battle of Hill 60 There were six battles attributed to the fighting in each sector in 1915. Four of the battles were attributed to the Second Battle of Ypres. These were Gravenstaffel, St. Julian, Fresenberg, and Bellewarde. The Battle of Hill 60 actually began in December 1914, with the British taking up the line there in early February 1915. The sixth battle was the second attack on Bellewarde from September 25th to 26th. The fighting at Hill 60 picked up on April 17th to 18th and continued throughout the period of the Second Battle of Ypres. As this was also a major battle, we are including it in this documentary. It explains the problems with sending reserve troops quickly to Second Ypres, as they were also needed for Hill 60, which is also part of the Ypres sector. Hill 60 was a spoil heap 230 meters high, made from the diggings of a cutting for the Ypres Comine Railway. The hill was a low rise on the crest of Ypres Ridge at the southern flank of Ypres Salient and was named after the contour which marked its boundary. The hill had been captured on November 11, 1914 by the German 30th Division during fighting against a mixed force of French and British infantry and cavalry in the First Battle of Ypres. Observation from the hill towards Ypres and Zillibig was coveted by both sides for the duration of the war. Hill 60 and the vicinity were held by Saxon Infantry Regiment 105 of the 30th Division, which with the 39th Division formed 15 Corps of the 4th Army at the time of the British attack. Tactical Developments The Imperial German Army was a military force drawn from the kingdoms of Prussia, Bavaria, Saxony, Baden, and Württemberg. During wartime, the federal contingents retained their identity and some independence from the Prussian army. In matters of manpower and maintenance of the order of battle, the non-Prussian contingents kept their autonomy. The Saxon and Württemberg armies were the smallest, and when the 28th Reserve Corps was formed, both armies contributed units, which after the 19th Corps became the 2nd Saxon Corps in the 4th Army. The attempt to prevent the national contingents from being taken over by the Prussian army had the unfortunate result that the Corps was affected by tensions between the two contingents. The Württembergers tended to denigrate the ability of Saxon units. Infantry Regiment 105, the Saxon Regiment in the Prussian 30th Division, relieved Infantry Regiment 132 at Hill 60 on December 16, 1914, and then took over Hill 69 and Zwartelin by December 21st. On December 29th, a French mine was sprung, which killed three soldiers and wounded 12. During the new year, French artillery fire increased, and on January 27th, the French detonated another mine near Swartelina. 
On February 3rd, the Saxons noticed that the troops opposite were British. In the first British operation of its kind, Royal Engineer Tunneling Companies laid six mines by April 10, 1915. This was an operation planned by Major General Edward Buffin, commander of the 28th Division, and continued by the 5th Division when the 28th Division was relieved. The 173rd Tunneling Company began work in early March, and three tunnels were begun towards the German line, about 50 yards or 46 meters away. A pit was first dug about 16 feet or 4.9 meters deep. By the time the work was finished, the tunnels stretched more than 100 yards or 91 meters. Two mines in the north were charged with 2,000 pounds or 907 kilograms of explosives each. One mine in the center had 2,700 pounds, one long ton charges, and in the south one mine was packed with 500 pounds, 227 kilograms of gun cotton, although work on it had been stopped when it ran close to a German tunnel. There were two other British and three French tunnels as well. The locality was photographed from the air, which revealed German gun emplacements and entrenchments. On April 16th, British artillery was ranged by air observers onto the approaches to Hill 60, ready for the attack. British infantry began to assemble after dark, as one squadron, Royal Flying Corps, was made responsible for keeping German aircraft away from the area. April 17th to 18th. On April 17th at 7.05 p.m., the first pair of mines were blown, and the rest 10 seconds later. There were five British and three French mines blown in total. Debris was flung almost 300 feet, 91 meters, into the air and scattered for over 300 yards, or 270 meters, in all directions, causing some casualties to the attacking battalions of the 13th Brigade of the 5th Division. The platoon of Saxon Infantry Regiment 105, or SIR 105, in the front line was killed, and the survivors were overwhelmed. Those capable of resistance were bayoneted. Zero Germans were taken prisoner for a British loss of seven casualties. An attempt to counterattack by the second company SIR 105 was tried, but the attack lacked liaison with the flanking companies since the mine explosion led to the approaches being open to view by the British. Some of the survivors of the second company ran back in fear that German gas cylinders earlier placed in the front line had been ruptured. The British began to consolidate and by 12.30 a.m. had dug two communication positions to the old front line. German artillery fire gradually increased on the hill after falling around it for some time and around 11.10 p.m. four companies from Infantry Regiment 99, Infantry Regiment 143 and the machine gun section attacked from the front and both flanks. The attack was repulsed by British machine gun fire but on the right the 8th Company of SIR-105 and Pioneers managed to bomb their way close to the craters and dug in under artillery fire. Around 3.15 to 4 a.m. on April 18th, three German counterattacks began, which were repelled with many losses. Bombing parties of the 2nd Company, Pioneer Battalion 15, got into a crater 
on the German left flank, but were then annihilated. German high explosive and gas shells and machine gun fire in Enfilé from Zanvorde and the Caterpillar forced the British back to the crest, except on the right flank where they were forced further back. German attacks continued all day on April 18th, but at 6 p.m. a counterattack by two British battalions retook the hill. 19th to 22nd April. Before dawn on April 19th, most of the 13th Brigade was relieved by the 15th Brigade. The Germans maintained a heavy bombardment of the hill and on April 20th, after two and a half hours of annihilation bombardment, attacked it again, mainly with bombing parties, before infantry assaults were attempted at 6.30 and 8 p.m. and defeated by British machine gun fire. German attacks continued into April 21st. By then, the hill had become a moonscape of overlapping shell holes and mine craters. The German infantry dug a jumping off line, a Sturmausgangstellung, and a stop line further back protected by the German artillery. The divisions of 2nd Corps and 5th Corps simulated attack preparations on April 21st, but on April 22nd and April 24th, the French 45th Division and Canadian 1st Division were struck by the 1st and 2nd major German gas attacks of the 2nd Battle of Ypres, and British artillery batteries were transferred northwards. May 1st to May 7th. Hill 60 was retaken by the Germans following a series of gas attacks on from May 1st to May 5th. On May 1st, a German attack preceded by a chlorine gas discharge failed for the first time. After a bombardment by heavy artillery, the Germans released the gas at 7 p.m. from positions fewer than 100 yards or 91 meters away from Hill 60 on a front of one quarter of a mile, about 100 meters. The gas arrived so quickly that most of the British troops were unable to put on their improvised respirators. As soon as the gas reached the British positions, the Germans attacked in the flanks with bombing parties as artillery laid a barrage on the British approaches to the hill. Some of the British garrison were able to return fire, which gave enough time for reinforcements to arrive after rushing to the gas cleft. The German infantry were stopped and bombing parties forced them back. The original British garrison suffered severely from holding on despite the gas and lost many casualties. The British 15th Brigade held the hill and about 1.25 miles or 2 kilometers of the line on either side. When the Germans discharged gas from two places opposite the hill at 8.45 a.m. on May 5th. The wind blew the gas along rather than across the British defenses, and only one sentry was able to sound the gas alarm. The British defense plan required troops under gas attack to move to the flanks, but the course of the gas cloud made this impossible. The gas hung so thick that even after redamping cotton respirators, it was impossible to remain in the trenches, and those troops who stood their ground 
who overcome. German infantry of the 30th Division advanced 15 minutes after the gas cloud and occupied nearly all of the front line on the lower slope of the hill. British reinforcements arrived and bombed their way up a communication trench and two more battalions were sent up. Before they arrived, the Germans released more gas at 11 a.m. to the northeast of the hill. The right flank of the British defense at Svartalin salient was overwhelmed, which increased the gap left by the first discharge. Enough men still survived on the left to pin the German infantry down until 12.30 p.m. when a battalion arrived after advancing through the gas cloud and an artillery barrage. Constant counterattacks forced some of the Germans back and regained several lost trenches. The Germans held on to the crest and released more gas at 6 p.m., which had little effect, and an infantry attack was followed and was repulsed by rifle fire. At 9 p.m., the 13th Brigade arrived with orders from Major General Moreland, the 5th Division commander, to retake the hill. The brigade attacked at 10 p.m. after a 20-minute bombardment, but found that the darkness, broken state of ground, and alert German infantry made it impossible to advance, except for one party, which reached the top of the hill, only to be for forced to withdraw at 1 a.m. by enfilade fire from the Caterpillar and Zwartalino. The hill was untenable unless the Caterpillar and a consider considerable amount of ground on the flanks was also occupied. Both sides were exhausted and spent the next day digging in. At dawn on May 7th, the British attacked the hill with two companies of infantry and attached bombers using hand grenades. All of these soldiers were killed or captured. Air operations. One squadron, with others, began standing patrols on April 17th at 4.30 a.m. with Avro 504s and BE-8s to cover the front between Kemmel Hill and until 7.15 p.m. No German aircraft were able to interfere and surprise was ensured. British artillery began a counter-battery bombardment when the attack began and one pilot was able to identify camouflaged German guns by flash spotting. By the morning of April 18th, British troops had been pushed back to the near slope, but a wireless and signal light station had been established at the headquarters of the 5th Division, to which air observers could report direct. British fighters drove away German aircraft, which tried to operate over the battlefield, and during the evening, the crest was recaptured. One squadron had eight aircraft over the hill at 6 p.m. to flash spot and discovered 33 guns. On April 19th, British artillery bombarded the areas where the guns had been seen, while the aircraft patrolled the area and noted that the German guns were far less active Next day, one squadron searched for a German battery firing on trenches on the hill and located the battery, which ceased fire. On April 21st, 
more German guns were suppressed by artillery fire directed from the air. German attacks diminished until May 1st when an aircraft flying towards Hill 60 caused the German artillery to cease fire as soon as it arrived until 7.15 p.m. when failing light forced the crew to return. At which the German artillery resumed the bombardment until a German infantry attack which was repulsed. On May 5th the Germans attacked again and captured the crest and held it against British counterattacks. On May 6th, one squadron conducted a photographic reconnaissance before another attack and quickly delivered these photographs to the commander of the attacking battalion. The attack failed and the operations were ended. Aftermath and Analysis the German army had been waiting for favorable weather to use gas in an attack at Ypres and used the fighting at Hill 60 to lay blame on the British for being the first to use gas after the British mistakenly accused the Germans. Doubts among some of the British commanders as to the tactical wisdom of converting a raid into an attack intended to retain the hill were born out of the cost of holding the hill and its loss as soon as the Germans had the opportunity to launch a methodical counterattack a gegen Angriff. Both sides alleged that their opponent had used gas. The Germans had dug in gas cylinders along 15th Corps front including Hill 60 and feared that some of the cylinders had fallen into British hands. The British had noticed the presence of gas but attributed it to gas shells which were not fired onto the hill by the Germans until April 20th. The German official history De Weltkrieg recorded that the British used new sapper detachments to prepare the attack on Hill 60 and that on April 18th Saxon troops had recaptured the hill except for the craters where the attack failed because the chemical shells Tigeschoss had been ineffective. The hill was recaptured by the Germans on May 5th and skirmishing continued until May 7th. Casualties In the attack on April 7th, the British lost only seven casualties. On May 1st, the 1st Dorsets lost over 90 men to gas poisoning. 207 were brought to dressing stations where 46 men died immediately and another 12 men died later. The battalion had only 72 survivors. The 1st Bedfords suffered similarly, having recently taken on many fresh and inexperienced replacements. Of 2,413 British casualties admitted to hospital, 227 men died. The 13th Brigade casualties from April 17th to 19th April were 1,362 and the 15th Brigade suffered 1,586 casualties from May 1st to May 7th out of the 5th Division total of 3,100 losses.